there is no there is no particular format but what we agreed was that I give you some uh, opening and then we have a question and answer period uh, because there are so many different interests in the room I would be happy to take your questions any questions that you may have and hopefully this type of a uh, exchange would be useful to most um, but the um, in terms of starting point um, typically uh, I do a few different things before I start working on a particular research topic in Canada we have to apply for grants and when we apply for grants these grants normally uh, the money that we receive normally goes to support students we hire research assistants as PhD students like right now I have five PhD students who work for me and these five PhD students I pay these students myself from my grants it's not the university but I, I choose the students and I pay them to be able to pay them I have to get a grant getting grants is difficult it's so to write a grant proposal I typically work on writing the grant proposal for three months I work at least three months to write a grant proposal and the duration of this grant proposal is typically five years so I have to plan what I will do for the next five years um, and I, I really have to explain in detail what I will do in the first year what I will do in the second year so this this grant proposal is anywhere between 20 to 30 pages uh, so so if I so if I am successful if I'm successful in getting this grant then I know what I will do in the next five years so the so the planning horizon the planning horizon is about say three to five years um, so to plan for to plan for three five years each year that you put into the grant proposal each year you promise that you will do two papers yeah, you will write two research papers so writing two research papers per year you're planning for the next five years you're talking about writing anywhere to eight eight to ten eight to ten papers to be able to write that many papers and to be able to plan for the next three five years uh, you have to know you have to know so much so how do you where do you get this information and like how do you decide what you will do uh, because things change fast or faster than you think so to be able to plan for the next three years five years um, I mean planning for one year is not optimal you know you have to plan you have to plan for, for at least two years um, if you if you can plan longer it's better to plan for the next four years five years you have to go to some strategic conferences you have to really choose you really have to choose the type of conferences that you go if you go to big conferences you get something if you go to smaller conferences smaller workshops it's different you 
you maybe listen to less papers, but you get to know the people well, and they become your referees, they become your, so, so you have to, you have to go to these kind of forward looking. Some conferences, you go and you don't learn much. You go there for networking. Some conferences, you go there, there is not much networking, but you learn a lot. Depends what you want. Do you want to network? You've done the work and then you want to disseminate your work or you, you, want, you want to be quiet and you want to learn a lot because you're planning for the future. So, so you have to decide, you know, like I typically go to three, sometimes four conferences every year and let's say average of three conferences. Um, so you have to choose, the conferences are, are like, you know, are like shopping, right? When you shop, you look and, so you have to decide what is the purpose of the conference, what direction that they're going, what is the mindset of the individuals, are there traditional scholars, are there new generation scholars, are they open to new ideas or they are more like conservative type of group of people. You, 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 you kind of know wh where you are going, what, what you're doing and so, so I go to these, I, I go to these conferences, say to, three conferences every year. Um, I also go at least one, sometimes two, uh, one day specialized workshops that I, I really specialize in. So these ones would be much more casual, informal, but there would be so much discussion where you can explore your ideas with the like-minded individuals. Um, so I would also, I would also do this. Um, so this is, this is what I do for, for myself. For my PhD students, when a PhD student starts with me, I always send my PhD student to a, to a type of a conference that I think it's important. So I pay, I pay his expenses, every, I pay all of his expenses and then I send my PhD student to this conference and then say, you know, go there, no presentation, just to listen. Go and listen and see, talk to people during the coffee break, get a feel, what is going on. So before the PhD student starts working, he goes to, sometimes I send one, sometimes I send them to two conferences to, to, to be exposed to uh, new directions, how people present, um, how people discuss, you know. Um, so then you, you go and explore some sources like, like you go to Science Direct, uh, you know, there, I mean, there are, there, there are a few, there, there are a few sources that, that, like Science Direct, I, I monitor, I monitor Science Direct. Science Direct is all the published, published papers published papers in various fields, including economics and finance. So, you, so those are the published papers. Scopus is, is a newer one. Scopus um, is, so the Scopus is a newer one. This one is by uh, Tom, Thompson and Reuters. It's an older one. Um, so if, if you search under the, you know, subject field, it, it'll tell you you know, all the published papers. Scopus is also the same thing, except uh, by Elsevier, Scopus would also tell you the Scopus would also tell you the published papers, although they also started to put some 
discussion papers. So these are the two sources that, just to make sure that others, others have not done what you're thinking about. Because what, what you're planning for five years. You're, you're planning for five years, you, you know, you, you go to Science Trek, you go to Scopus, but then there are a number of, uh, um, if you go to um, SSRN, Social Sciences Research Network, these ones are, are not published yet. They are not published. They are kind of discussion, new papers, perhaps submitted to journals, but these are not published yet. So you also go to uh, um, social SSRN to see uh, work, work in progress. But whether you look at Scopus, whether you look at uh, Science Track, whether you go to SSRN, if you don't go to these important meetings, important conferences, you're always late. Because most information, the new information, who's working in which direction, who's going to pursue this, these type of information you get at these particular type of meetings to be at the front. Um, once you do the once you do this, once you do the search, um, of course, I mean you have to, you have to uh, put together the search and you have to write it. Um, in terms of in terms of writing it, the introduction. The introduction has to be a, a really nice, beautiful, beautifully explained exposition. It, it has to pull the reader into it. Like you know how they make movies? They make movies and then they have the clip of a movie, right? The trail, they call it a trail. You go to YouTube, and you look at the trail of a movie, like maybe 20 seconds, you look at the movie and you say, oh my God, this is an interesting movie, I should go and see it, right? Like the music, the, the video, and you look at this trail and you say, wow, I should go and see this movie. The introduction of the paper should be like that. The introduction of the paper is like when and the person reads the introduction, the person says, wow, I should read this paper. This is an interesting paper. Um, so, that, so writing an introduction, like when I write the, my papers, probably I, the, the number of revisions that I go through in terms of writing the introduction, maybe seven, eight, nine revisions. Like, I've been around for 25 years. Like, still, still, my re the, by the time I, I write, by the time that I submit the paper for a journal, it's probably revised six, seven times. Um, so writing, writing an introduction is difficult because you have to tell the reader what you're doing. You you have to tell the reader why you're doing it. Why is it that it's important? It's not that it's important to you. I mean, it's, it may be important to you, but it's not important for me. It has to be important to a lot of people because it'll go to two, three referees, and you have to convince that what you're doing is important. And you have to, you have to tell it so convincingly. The rejection rates in these journals is very high, you know. The rejection rate is 95%, 96%, 97%, the top journals, it's very difficult. Everybody has a lot of good ideas, not just you. Everybody has a lot of good ideas. Everybody is working hard. Everybody is working hard. People are working 60 hours, 70 hours every week. People work every day in academia. 
people, people start at 6 a.m., they go home, they have, they have dinner, they work in, in front of the computers, they work on Saturdays, and they work on Sundays. People work every day. People, in academia, people kind of push it. And so you're competing in this, in this sphere where a lot of people are working so hard, so engaged, so informed, and so polished. So why do you think that you're so important? Like, what makes you important as an author? Why should I read you? I don't have time, right? The editor says, the editor kind of, um, like I was talking to one editor when I was an assistant professor, and I said, like, what do you do when a paper comes to you? He said, well, I kind of smell. If it doesn't smell nice, I send it back. I said, I said, that's not nice. That's kind of biased. He said, well, that's why they put me here, you know? So you, you, you always think that you are important. Your ideas are important. But the point is that you have to convince others to publish. If, if you're not interested in publishing, that's another story. But if you want to publish, you have to convince others that you think well, you reason well, and then you convey those, that type of ideas and the reasoning well to others. And that's not easy. That's not easy. So, the introduction. And in the introduction, you can't just, you just cannot reference, of course you have to reference others, but you can't just reference others as this person has done this, this person has done that, and this person did this. No. You have to put it into a context. You have to refer to them in a, in a context. You have to, it has to be a good story. The, re, the, the way that you reference them, it has to be natural. If you just kind of put them in, you know, I did the liter liter literature review and I found these 20 papers, here they are, you know, for completeness, it, that doesn't work. Because they know that you're just doing it for the sake of completeness, not for functionality. You know, it has, it has to be very functional. Um, of course, then, after the introduction, you have the methodology. After the methodology, you have your results. Um, all, of the, all of the tables, you, you cannot have redundant tables. Because if you have too many tables, too many figures, whatever that you put in as tables and figures, you have to explain them in the text so clearly, functionally. You can't just say, you know, I've done this figure and this figure supports me and please look at the figure. No, that's not, that's not going to work. You should make it so easy for the referee. It's like you have to serve the referee so that the referee kind of follows easily because you, you are burdening the referee. The referee has no time. The referee is another scholar. He's busy and he doesn't make money out of this. It's a service. If you make it difficult for the referee, the referee is going to be upset. You know, I mean, he's busy. So, so you, you have to explain you have to explain your tables and the figures in the text as, as parsimoniously as you can as you can. When you go go to the end of the paper where you list your figures and when you list your tables, those figures and those tables have to be such that the person should be able to understand the meaning and the interpretation of those figures or tables just there. So you have to put captions. Those captions in those tables and the figures should make that, those figures and the tables self-standing. If you make the referee to go back to the text to understand those tables and figures, it doesn't work. There has to be like if you look at these top journals, they, they put sufficient amount of information 
to the top or the bottom of those tables or figures to make it self-standing. It has to be self-standing. Um, I mean, so, so you, you bring it to that level and then once you, once you have written the paper, typically what we have is that in our, in our departments we, we call them lunch seminars or we call them brown back seminars. You go and present it in front, in front of your colleagues with the purpose that if you have made a big mistake, if something is, is not making sense, you missed something, so that these mistakes are found out before you go and present it to the outside world. Um, so the brown bags or the lunch presentations are so important. So you don't really hide it from your colleagues. Like you, in, in fact, you expose it to your colleagues so that they see and they say, no, 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 like you're missing this or this is not right. And so you sort it out, you clean it out. Um, and then you try to go and present it a couple of other places. Um, so I would say you, you present at least two, three, four times before you submit to a journal. Uh, or even before you submit to a conference. Like you try to present in the, in the city, in your department, small group of scholars, because you always, there's always a question that becomes important to fix it up. Um, uh, and then once you get that feedback, I think it is important to present, if you can, at a conference to get further feedback. Once you, once you get that feedback, then uh, you revise further. But once you do those, once you do those, then what I do is that I typically send it to editing, scientific editing. Uh, scientific editing is not cheap. It's like it costs $200. <coughs> Three hundred dollars to to there are there are so many companies who do the editing. Like um, let me see whether the internet is here. So this one, uh, American American Journal Experts. There are others, but the the American Journal Expert Expert is a editing service. They edit. They edit papers. I mean, like, I, I send my papers there. Like, I work so hard to write my papers, and I revise and revise and revise, and then I bring it to a certain level. I, bring my, I send my papers there because they are scientific editors. They, they fix, like, they really, so you, if you have the money, if you have the funds, I would send it there and then get it edited. Because often, if you send it to a journal, let's say you're submitting from an un less known country, um, l whichever that country is, and then you, you send it, the referee says, well, there are a lot of, although it's well written, they find one or two grammar mistakes or something, then they say, well, it's, this paper has some syntax error and the grammar mistake, they send it back. But then you paid the submission fee because you have to pay a submission fee of $100, $150, $200. So these journals now is, are not free. You have to pay a submission fee. And the submission fees are, you know, $200. So if you, if you get rejected, you lose that $200. You better get it edited, better edited, so that at least they cannot reject for the content. I mean, typically, if you get it edited by these, by these services, this is one of them, like there are others. If you don't have the funds, if, you do, if the funds are not available, you cannot afford that, then find another way. But it's always a good idea that that you get it edited. And they have different levels of service. 
uh, I mean, this is, I don't want to advertise for them or anything like that. It's, uh, they, some of them just edit the language. Some of them you, you say, I, wanna t I want to target these, these uh, journals. And then they kind of edit, it's more expensive, but then they edit along these lines that becomes the style, the style becomes. So you, so you have to compete. You have to compete in some way. You have to bring your product at a, at a level which is, which is compatible with the market. And, and, and like I know that people now in, uh, scholars now in different places, like China, for instance, they used to send it without editing. Now they send it with editing. Like they're they're so careful now. They have the funds that they they use these services, and then the, the manuscript looks very. Some words are more sophisticated. It flows better. Uh, like if you if you have so many figures, if you keep saying this figure shows this, this figure shows that, that's too much using shows. Like you cannot use. It looks so kind of doesn't read well like it has to be it has to flow like a poem you know and these these people do that um, you have to know each journal has a certain type of a vision strategy the board the editor so like I now know that if I see a paper um, like if I write a paper, I say, no, this paper does not go to this journal because, because I know. Uh, you, you kind of know which, which paper belongs to which journal. You know, you, kind of, you know that if you send it there, it's not going to work. If you send it to somewhere else, you know that it's going to work because you more or less know what they publish, what they don't publish, what is it that they like, what is it that they don't like, what is their vision you kind of know so somehow you have to talk to scholars talk to people you have to determine what is realistic like wh wh where, where, where you should target um, otherwise you it's a waste of money and a waste of time because sometimes you send it and then you pay and then it sits there six months and then you lose six months you know um, and I mean, uh, I have seen all type of situations where if you target the wrong journal, um, you know, it can come back very quickly. I mean, the, the worst that I heard is that somebody sent it and it came back in seven minutes. Um, in some sense, that's pretty efficient, and on the, on the other hand, it's very embarrassing. <laughs> um, but otherwise, you know, it, it sits there for Three, three months, four months, six months, and then comes back, comes back, and so when it comes back, let's say it send, they send it to two, three referees, and each one of them with some reports, and they are, if you're lucky, they're asking for a revision. Revision. If, they're, if you're lucky, they ask you to revise. A reasonable revision, like if you get two, three reports, a reasonable revision would take anywhere from two to six months because some of these revisions are very extensive. You have to take these revisions very seriously. Like you can't say, you know, I'm, I'm going to answer these questions, but I'm not going to answer those. You, every question that the referee is asking for, you have to write a memorandum. The memorandum is like, you know, thank you for your comments. You know, I understand your direction. And let me and address your first question. Answer. Let me go on to answer your second question. Answer. In regard to your third question, I don't think that this is, re don't say reasonable. I don't think that, I, I, don't, I wish that I prefer to keep as it is. These are the reasons that I will not pursue these directions. Maybe I will pursue them in another and then move on to the fourth question. But in a very reasonable, very respectful way, try to address those questions in your memorandum. Memorandum is a separate document. You, you type, 
right? And then you save it as a PDF. And then you answer, like typically what I do is when I get a report from a referee, I take his, his questions, put them in quote, because that's how he, how he said. I say, this is what you ask, here's my answer. And then the next second, this is what you have asked, here's my answer. I answer everything that I, they're asking for, everything. I don't leave anything behind. Either I do it, if, if I think that I should, should not or I could not, I, I tell it. I, I say, you know, um, so if it is one referee, you do it for the memorandum for the one first referee. If, if there are three referees, then you do all three of them. And then you put it together, so then you have three memoranda. And then you write a cover letter to the editor because the editor may also have additional comments, you also say same thing in the cover letter, what the editor asked for, quote, answer, quote, answer, and then you say, you, you provide a summary saying that you addressed all of the questions of the referees in this way and, you know, so that the, it, you make it easier for the editor. You can't just say to the editor, you know, please go and see the memoranda. You know, that's not, <laughs> the editor may not like that. Um, then you send it back. What if the, you receive three reports and, and then the editor read those reports and the editor decided to reject your paper? After six months, eight months, you got the response, three reports, the editor said, sorry, I looked at these reports and they are, they are, they are important parts of your paper, but um, the contributions are not deep and extensive enough, and I'm sorry to convey to you that I decided to reject your paper. Even if you get rejected, you have to do those revisions. Don't send it to another journal like that, like before, because then you make a reputation, because often the referees are the same. The referee pool is not huge. It may be that it goes back to the same referee and then the referee complains, you know, to the editor privately that you don't know um, some route and then you get an immediate rejection. If, there, if a referee or set of referees have put time into your work, if they have given you feedback and if you think that this feedback is useful, if you value this feedback, then take this feedback into account before rushing and sending to another journal. You know, they wouldn't know what I have done and I, no, you, you, do the, you do the revisions and, uh, and the community is very small. Like you hear, when you go to these conferences, you hear that, oh, you know this, you know, I had refereed this and then he, he didn't change and it came back to me and so the community is very reasonably small that um, um, so that would be that would be um, you know how, how I do how I do the revisions you, you you have to do the revisions but then you have to explain your revisions extensively um, the memoranda you know those set of memorandum also should be edited and the language has to be clean and flows well and so on. Um, the the A-level journals, you know, the acceptance rate is somewhere around 5% or less than 5%. Um, very difficult to get in. B-level journals, typically the rejection rate varies around uh, 80%, 85%. It's a little bit easier to get in, but even then it's, it's not that easy. Uh, C level doesn't work. I mean, in, in the impact of the C level, um, if you can manage for B, A is always difficult. I mean, you always aim for A, but A is difficult. But if you cannot manage A, then you know, you try to do some level of B. If you, if you get, you know, a few Bs um, right after your graduation, um, like this year in my university, 
we had openings for two positions, hiring new faculty to, to pro, for two assistant professors. So we advertised and uh, 400 applications came all around the world. Uh, out of these 400 publications, these are PhD students, just about to finish, right? These, uh, out of these uh, um, uh, uh, 400 applications, a significant percentage of them have already published, have already published B. Some of them are even A. So these PhD students, the competition is now that you know, you don't publish two years, three years after you get a job. You really have to publish now before you graduate. Uh, and, you, and you have to publish at B. So if, if you can publish at a B level, then, then you go ahead. Um, uh, and don't, like I had some conversations here, you know, breakfast conversations, lunch conversations, conversations uh, with the dean. Um, don't think that, oh, this is difficult, this is impossible, you know, for us it's difficult. It's difficult for everybody. It's difficult, it's always difficult. Publishing is always difficult. Publishing is always a challenge. Sometimes you get, you publish more, you think that it gets easier, it gets more, even harder. Like, I, I, I work on it and Publishing is not easy. So don't think that people have a bias towards you, you know, that they don't like papers coming from some places, you have a disadvantage, and don't, please don't think like that. Be very open-minded, but at the same time, try to fix those type of issues, like editing and tables and figures are being self-standing, uh, story, story being told in a very effective manner. Um, discuss with your colleagues and friends openly to try to convince them what you're doing is important. Sometimes you discuss with someone and the person says, you know what, I don't know, it's, it's, it's okay, it's, it's not a big deal. It's like, it's, this is, so you get a feeling of whether they really like your idea and whether you're, so as long as you, you do these things, uh, it'll happen. It'll happen. Um, um, so that's, that's um, uh, and maybe a further note is that to be able to do these things, you need funds. Like to submit to a journal, go to conferences, uh, editing. Um, I don't know how it works here, but I would try to use all possible sources uh, to collaborate, to come together with different colleagues, maybe form a research center. Um, you know, you can always form some sort of a union and use this research center and union to try to get funds from agencies like the European Union and, and other places. Because getting funds individually is, is difficult. But if you, if you can form some sort of a entity that you think that this entity, like sometimes people get along, you know, sometimes people get along, they like each other, sometimes people don't because there are conflicts, you know. You, you don't have to get along, you know. You don't have to get along to do these things. You do these things because it's good for everybody. You do it for the selfish, perhaps. If there's no, uh, you, you, you come together so that everybody gets something out of it. Because if you don't, nothing is going to happen. Uh, to uh, uh, forming some type of a, farm, some sort of type of a entity is useful. Uh, you know, you try um, and for, forming these entities um, are not necessarily expensive. You have to convince your dean, your dean has to convince the president, and then it has to go through the Senate. If the Senate approves it, then you, know, then, then you have an entity, and it becomes a legal entity. Once it becomes a legal entity, then you can seek funds under this legal entity. Um, uh, 
otherwise, if you try to do it individually, it's not easy. Once you have such an entity, then you know, hopefully you get some money from, even if you get not much, like if, if sometimes you get 5,000, 10,000 euro, that's a lot of money because you can use it for submission fees, you can pay for some conferences, you can pay for editing, you know. You, uh, so I would also use the, I would also use the synergy, synergy between, I mean university is also a type of synergy. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll stop here and, and take any questions that you might have.